All right, as you find your way back to your seats here, we'll be in uh, two passages primarily this evening. Uh, so if you have multiple markers, you want to use them. Uh, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, and then Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Those will be our main texts. We'll have others, uh, of course, that we'll look at through the message. So get your places in Matthew 28 and Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> Things that are designed to go are also designed to need power. Think about your car. It wasn't just made to look nice and to sit in your driveway and to leak oil all over the place. It was created to take you places. But in order for it to accomplish its created purpose, it needs power. It needs something put into it. I, I'm going to very simply, and I need to speak simply because I don't know a whole lot about the inner workings of cars, so I'm not going to try to wax eloquent. That's above my pay grade. But I do know this, that a car needs a couple things, very crucial things, if it's going to go anywhere. It needs a battery that works, and it needs fluids. You have a dead battery, you're not going anywhere. You don't have enough fluids, you're, you're going to kill your engine. You're not going to go anywhere. You need those things. If either of them is missing, your car is not going to go on its own. You can have it towed, you can push it, but that gets tiring after a while. Imagine the foolishness of thinking that simply waxing your car or vacuuming out the inside or cleaning out your trunk or putting that nice air freshener in there so that you can have that pseudo new car smell that everybody just loves. And you think that that's going to make your car function. To add to the ridiculousness of what is already a ridiculous illustration, if you'll just bear with me for another minute or two, imagine that you live next door to an auto parts store and a gas station. You have access to literally everything that you need to make your car go like it's supposed to, but you prioritize the extras and you neglect the power sources. If you think that sounds silly, imagine a church that tries to ignore the power of God. Imagine a Christian who tries to be a witness without trusting in God's power, both for their own life and for their witness. That may not sound as silly as it does convicting, because that reality is our struggle. We have the power of God readily available to us. It's been provided for us. It's been promised to us. Yet often other things consume our attention. We can get more focused on politics than we can about the Great Commission, especially right now. We can get more focused on debating preferences and standards than we are on the Great Commission. We can get more focused on trying to live up to other people's standards and make other people happy with us than we are about complete, completing the Great Commission. There's no question that the Great Commission should be the most important focus for us as a church and the regular practice of every single Christian. So what we need is to connect ourselves to the power of God which is the power to help us fulfill the Great Commission and to obey the last and greatest command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking tonight at the power of the Great Commission. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. You'll hold your place there. Go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Father, we need your help tonight. We need to be witnesses. And you've placed us all strategically, uniquely, in our circumstances with the people who are around us so that we can reach them. I pray that you would help us to do that. We need your power. We need boldness. It can be very easy, unfortunately, for us to make excuses, to shy away from witnessing opportunities. It's not as though we don't care about souls. We don't want people to go to hell. But we just get caught up on our own agenda. We get caught up in our own fears, and that paralyzes us from witnessing. Lord, I just pray you'd give us, give us a fire in our heart for the souls of men. Help us to, as, as Jesus did, looking out under the fields, 
to have such compassion to do everything possible to meet the greatest need that any person has ever had, and that is a need for a Savior. We have a Savior. We've trusted in a Savior. We are being sustained by a Savior. Lord, help us not to be ashamed of our Savior. Help us to be uh, willing and, and very eager to share our wonderful Savior with those who need Him so that they can enjoy Him as Savior as well, now and in eternity. Please guide us with your word. Guide us in our witness. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like us to consider first how the power of the Holy Spirit brings conviction. And we'll look at that conviction in two parts. First, we'll look at conviction prior to salvation. Now, when, in spiritually speaking here, when I'm talking about conviction, we're talking about what happens in a person's soul when they come face to face with truth and they are convinced that they are wrong. They are told, they are declared to be guilty. When the Holy Spirit convicts a lost sinner, He is bringing that lost sinner into direct contact with the truth of His Word and is showing that sinner that he is undeniably guilty before Almighty God. And at that point, and you've heard me talk lately, and I'll, I'll use the term again on Sunday morning, uh, de- having, being at a decision point. Whenever we got saved, we came to a decision point. And it might have been that before you got saved, you were at that decision point several times. And at that point, you are experiencing the conviction, or you were experiencing the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you have to make a decision. Am I going to respond to this conviction by humbling myself and submitting to the Lord and accepting Him as my Savior? Or will I respond to this conviction by putting up all kinds of walls? And, and I'm not talking about Tim Walls. We don't want, we'll just leave him out of it. But we put up all kinds of walls and we, we come up with all kinds of excuses. We're afraid. Uh, what was it that maybe kept you from saying yes to Jesus the first time? How, let me just ask this question. How many of you, to the best of your knowledge, you got saved the first time somebody gave the gospel to you? Okay. There are two. And that's not unusual. Most of the rest of us, we probably heard the gospel several times. And we were convicted. And we responded for at varying lengths of time. It might have been years. It might have been days, weeks. It might have been decades for you. I don't know. For me, I know specifically that when I was 12, I realized I wasn't saved, and I fought conviction until I was 14. So for two years, and it was miserable. And if you've been there, you know the misery of fighting the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And my response to Jesus, to that conviction for two years, was no. I'm fine on my own. I'd rather... I'd rather live for the, the approval of man than submit myself to God. I want to call my own shots. And so that was my response to conviction. And then on May 2nd of 2001, I responded by the Lord's grace by receiving Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And so people are going to respond prior to salvation. They're going to respond to conviction of one of two ways. They'll yield to it and submit to the Lord and be saved, or they'll reject it and turn away. Um, if you're in Acts, just turn to chapter 2 and verses 36 and 37. Therefore let, all the house, or therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And that's the tail end of a message that Peter was preaching here at Pentecost. Uh, the Lord gave him and the other apostles the ability to uh, be understood in a variety of foreign tongues, of languages, and that was the working of the Holy Spirit unique to this time frame. We have the totality of Scripture. Tongues are no longer necessary. Uh, as far as the, the gift of the Spirit of speaking tongues, we have God's Word. We don't need that. It's a gift that has passed away. So he has preached this whole sermon to them. He's gotten down to his application. That application is basically being used by the Holy Spirit to bring conviction, telling them, you killed Jesus. You are guilty. And how did they respond? Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were convicted. They understood. They felt the weight of their guilt. And they respond the way that a person must if they're going to receive Christ. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? What, what do we need to do? They, they didn't keep making excuses. They didn't try to throw Peter out. They didn't try to kill Peter and just silence him because that was better than the conviction that they were feeling. They said, what must we do? And they responded to that, that conviction by saying, we want, we want what Jesus wants. We need this. And so then Peter answers and he says, repent 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's the conviction prior to salvation. I'd like us next to consider conviction that is produced by salvation. So that's talking about us as believers experiencing the Holy Spirit's conviction. I don't need to tell you this, you already know this, but the Holy Spirit's conviction didn't stop the day we got saved. At least, it shouldn't have stopped the day we got saved. There's still sin that you commit. And when you commit that sin, you get convicted about it. The Lord tells you you're wrong. This needs to get out of your life. This needs to change. And you feel that weight, understanding that there needs to be a course correction. And thankfully, God's Word gives us everything that we need so that we can live right. Hold your place and go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. There is no single word in this book that did not come directly from God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I've talked through what that means before, but let me do it again. That doctrine is, is the teaching, the information that we need about God and who He is and, and how we're to live. Reproof is that conviction, that confrontation understanding you're wrong. None of us enjoys hearing that we're wrong. I, I was talking to the students this morning in chapel, and I asked them that question. How many of you like to be told that you're wrong? And there's always a couple clowns that put their hands up and, and just, oh, I, I do, and they don't. Nobody really likes to be told that they're wrong. But that's what we need. And that's really an ultimate sign of God's love for us. He chastens, he disciplines those that he loves, if I, you know, I claim to love my children, and I do, but if I never corrected them and I never stopped them from doing destructive things, that wouldn't be an act of love. Now, this world's going to tell you, oh, just let them do whatever. No, if I hated my children, I'd let them do whatever. But my children, there's foolishness bound up in their hearts, as it is in the heart of every child, and, and there are many people that don't lose that foolishness, unfortunately. But God's Word reproves us. It corrects us, or it convicts us. The correction, that next part, is... is taking the reproof, the conviction, turning it into a direction that we need to go. So we've learned that we're wrong. We've learned that it's wrong to look at this. We've lo we're learned that it's wrong to say this, to do this. What do we do from here? God's Word gives us correction, tells us where we need to go. And then instruction in righteousness, telling us how to keep going in the direction that we need to go, how to continue living right. God's Word has it all. And then verse 17 tells us that the man of God may be perfect, Truly furnished unto all good works. God's Word gives us everything that we need to live right. We just need to connect to it. It's got all the power that we need to live a life that pleases God. We just need to be in the book so that we can receive that power. Uh, the last couple passages, you can make note of those, uh, but for the sake of time, we'll not visit them. Psalm 119 talks about hiding God's Word in our heart, memorizing it in Galatians, uh, walking in the Spirit so that we don't fulfill the lusts of our flesh. But God graciously brings conviction None of us enjoys it, but we all need it because it ultimately exposes the sin in our heart and helps us to understand that we need to get back with the Lord. Next, I'd like us to consider how the power of the Holy Spirit brings courage. And that courage, first of all, uh, is, gives us the ability to speak of the Lord, to testify, to witness. Because of our own frailty, it is easy for us to shy away from witnessing opportunities. I asked last week, uh, rhetorically, I didn't want anybody to raise their hand, but uh, ask again, how, how many times can you think of where there was a very clear opportunity, there was somebody that maybe they're handing you the food at the restaurant, or somebody asked you a question, a coworker started talking about this or that, and it was a perfect opportunity to witness, and you just didn't. And we've probably all been there, regrettably, where we knew I need to tell this person about the Lord. There's a reason that I'm here talking with them right now. And for whatever reason, we walk away from that. We need help being courageous with our witness. We need help telling lost and sometimes combative sinners that they are wrong and need to turn to Jesus Christ to be saved. We get more nervous about the rebuke or the criticism that we might face from people than we do about the fact that the soul of those people will go to hell in the lake of fire for all of eternity. 
And we need that perspective. We need to understand that and have that always before us. Jesus did. That's why he gave his life. But thankfully, God's word gives us the, the answers that we need through his word, through his spirit. He will give us the boldness that we need. He will give the power to those who are fully committed to fulfilling the Great Commission. If you're uh, back in Acts, go to chapter 4, and we'll look at verses 31 through 33. Acts chapter 4, verses 31 through 33. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. And so they preach, and they preach. And this coming on the heels of Peter and John being arrested because they were preaching and, being, or, and telling the people who arrested them, um, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. When you're staring down a government official who is telling you, if you keep talking about Jesus, you're going to get in trouble, and this is going to be bad. And in many cases, I mean, this what they do is they basically give them a slap on the wrist and then they, they dismiss them. Later on, um, much later on, Peter will lose his life for the Lord John will be exiled until he passes away. Uh, and so they both face punishment for their faith. But there are many Christians in the world today who it's not just being a slap on the wrist. It's not just a little bit of criticism from a neighbor or a family member or, or the loss of a job. They understand that if they tell somebody about Jesus, they could die. Or somebody that they love could die. There are many people who would be willing to die themselves for the Lord, but if their family members are being threatened, I, I would love to say, and I'll just make it personal, I'd love to say that if, if it came to that here, and I, I pray that it doesn't, but if it came to that here and my family were being threatened and I were told that something would happen to them if I didn't give up the Lord, I would love to think that I, I love the Lord enough to stay faithful to Him and to trust my family into His hands. But that is a very difficult situation, and there are many believers today that are in that situation and count the Lord worthy to suffer for and trust their families to the Lord, and so they, they stand firm. That takes courage. Again, we're not in that situation. Most of the time, the worst that we face is, I don't want that. No thanks. I'm fine. I'm good. And even that causes us to shy away. Let's, let's ask the Lord for boldness to speak on his behalf, for courage to witness to those who desperately need it. His Holy Spirit also gives us courage to seek the lost. We're told in, in Luke 19.10 that the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. We are to follow our Savior's example. Uh, you'll hold your place here and <coughs> go back to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 and verses 37 and 38. Let me, let me go back, verse 36. And this is typical of Jesus. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Witnessing opportunities are as varied as any other interaction that we might have with somebody. Sometimes we are approached by somebody in an, a normal situation and a conversation is brought to us. Sometimes we have something to say to somebody and we seek them out in order to talk with them. Gospel conversations are like that as well. But I believe that we should pray that the norm will be that we have the opportunity to initiate these conversations, that we are seeking them out rather than waiting for them always to be handed to us. If you consider what Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, telling them to um, pray that the Lord will send laborers into the harvest. You go back to Matthew 28... And Jesus is doing what he told them to pray for in Matthew chapter 9. He is sending them out. He is sending out the laborers. When you think about the, the context, they were very likely in the midst of, of a field with wheat. 
And so Jesus, very practical in, in many of his illustrations. I also mentioned this to the students in chapel, that I believe that many times when Jesus says something like, behold the, the lilies of the field, and behold the fowls of the air, he was probably pointing at flowers and pointing at a flock of birds that flew over at that moment. He used what was around him to, to give you a, a much better illustration than my silly car illustration at the beginning of the message. But here he's, he's there, and there's, there's fields that are white, ready to be harvested, and so he uses a physical illustration to to point out something spiritual to them, and that is that you need to go and tell people about me. Something that we need to understand as we consider that truth is that laborers don't wait, in this context, about somebody going into the field. The laborers don't wait for the wheat to come to them. They go and they harvest the wheat. They have to go into the field. The wheat's not just going to come to them and say, hey, let's, I need to get harvested. They have to go and they have to do the work. I believe that there was a purpose in Jesus saying this as he did. And then in Matthew 28, using that word go, we are to go. And the, the world is this field. All nations are this field. And regardless of how receptive a person may seem or a nation is to the gospel, folks, today the fields are white unto harvest. There are so many people, billions of people on this planet that will spend eternity in a lake of fire. And that's just a simple fact of, of math. There aren't enough Christians getting around to tell people about Christ. You and I can't reach every single person in the world ourselves. And, and we've used the illustration. I've used it. I think Cliff has used it in Sunday school. John probably has used it in Sunday school. All of us probably have used it because it's a, a helpful illustration, and we live next to the coast, and we can relate to this. But the grandfather and his grandson walking along, and there's starfish. And you probably know where I'm going already, but that's all right. And the grandson picks up the starfish, and he just tosses it in the water. And then he picks up another one, and he tosses it in the water. And he goes down a little bit, and he picks up another one, and he tosses it in the water. And his granddad's looking, there's, the beach is littered with all of these starfish, and uh, his grandson's not really making a dent in the dying starfish population. And so he tells him, what are you doing? You're not making any difference. And he picks one up, and he throws it in the water, and he said, I made a difference for that one. And I made a difference for that one. We can make a difference for one person at a time. And if every believer committed to reach one person, now hopefully the Lord gives us more opportunities to reach more, per, more people, but if, if we committed, just think of the people who are in this room, if we committed each to reach one person for Christ, that would double the amount of Christians per this group. And then if everybody in that group went and reached somebody, it would just keep multiplying. That's what God wants us to do, to go into the fields and to reach somebody for Christ. And God gives us the courage to do that, but we need to do it. Jesus was willing to do it. He left heaven to come and seek and save that which was lost. Surely we can go into the world, as Jesus has told us, and seek out people who need Jesus Christ and overcome any fear that may be there and be more concerned that if they die, their soul will be damned to hell for all of eternity if they don't turn. And we need to do something about it because we can. So let's pray for that courage. Finally, let's look at how the power of the Holy Spirit brings change. And as, as you hopefully are finding out in your walk with the Lord, there is change to the person. The power of the gospel, that phrase is not just some cliche that Christians throw around. It's a reality that we live every single day of our lives. In the case of the Apostle Paul, and I'll have you turn to Acts chapter 9. In the case of the Apostle Paul, the power of the gospel took one of the fiercest opponents to the cause of Christ and transformed him into one of the greatest advocates of the cause of Christ. Night and day change. One of the great blessings that I've had in pastoring is seeing the power of the gospel change lives and to see people grow. Now, Growth is different from person to person. Your growth spiritually is not going to necessarily be the same as somebody across the room. Just like physically, people grow at different rates. I used my twins as an example of this often. Hope and faith, they are the same age. Hope, hope was uh, born 30 seconds or so before faith. Uh, faith has always been bigger. She's a little bit taller, and she doesn't mind me saying this now. Of course, she's not in here to hear it, but she's about four pounds heavier. There will come a time where they will not want me to divulge that information, and I will not, but they're five, and they don't care. But they, as twins, they're identical twins. Many of you still have a hard time telling them apart. 
and you're laughing because you know it's true. Sometimes my wife and I say the wrong name, but that's just we have five kids, and sometimes the wrong name comes out. Thankfully, we don't have a dog, otherwise our dog's name would probably come out too. And you know that you've done that, so don't look at me like I'm some forgetful dad. But my daughters are a great example of, of two people who, in their case, were born basically at the same time, but their growth has been a little bit different. And mentally and developmentally, they have grown at different rates. Hope, and this probably doesn't surprise people who know my daughters well enough, Hope was the first one to walk. Okay? She's much more active. She takes after charity, and Faith takes after me. She doesn't move as much as her, do- or as her sister does. I, don't, I, I move when I have to, and that's it. Um, so they have grown at different rates. You are not going to be held accountable for growing at somebody else's rate. Okay? God's not going to hold you to somebody else's standard. He is developing you. That's why I love the fact that he's called a personal Savior. He has a personal relationship with each and every one of us. It is, it is personalized for us. We don't have the walk with God that somebody else has, so don't try to. Don't, don't be down because you're not just like somebody else. You don't have the walk. Maybe use somebody as an example and say, you know what, I know this person prays a lot. I need to pray a lot too. I know this person reads their Bible a lot more than I do. I need to read my Bible more. I know this person witnesses a lot more than I do. I need to be a witness. We can use somebody as a positive example, but don't expect that you are going to be them because Jesus doesn't expect you to be them. He is working on your heart. He's working to develop you so that you grow, but you need to grow, and you're not going to grow if you're not in this book. So get in the book if you're not. John, or Acts chapter 9, verses 11, and I have down through uh, 22, so let me read fast, and you can listen fast. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many that of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints in Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. And I think in parentheses he's thinking, and you've told him what my name is. Thanks a lot. But no, he goes on. The Lord said, verse 15, The Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway He preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them, which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. You want to talk about a change. You've got a man who hated Jesus and was killing people for it. And now he's preaching his name. And it it totally threw people off. And there was some time, I think, before people trusted Saul, Barnabas. In verse 27, it says, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he, he basically stands up for him. He gives him another chance. I love Barnabas. I want to be like Barnabas. And, and it's just such a tremendous example. But you want to talk about a change. Maybe... You don't have to go all the way back to the Apostle Paul. You can look at your own heart and you can see the change that exists there. You know who you were. You know what you did. You know the sin, the wickedness that was in your heart. And you look at the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. And, and it, it challenges you. Because you know what you could have been if it wasn't for the grace of God. Folks, I hope that you regularly thank your Savior for what He did for you. 
One of the things that I like about living down south is that people have more manners than they, in some places, um, than they do um, up north. And so one thing that I, we try to, are trying to teach our children is to have manners and to say thank you regularly and please regularly. And, and that, you, you know that you like to be thanked. If you hold the door or give somebody something, it's just courteous. You like to be thanked. And you kind of maybe feel a little bit put out if you're not thanked. How do you imagine Jesus feels when we don't thank him for saving us? How do you think he feels when we, we live as though salvation is a light thing and we can just get more grace the more we sin? How do you think he feels about that? I don't think he feels very good about it at all. If God has changed your heart, and I trust that he is, I trust that you're saved and that he's working in your heart, thank the Lord for that. Spend time every single day thanking the Lord for what he has done and live like a brand new Christian. Live like somebody who is being changed so that people can see a difference in your heart. So that you can see a difference in your heart. There was a tremendous difference in Paul's and he made a difference for Christ because of it. And then once the person is changed, their purpose changes. There is a change to their purpose. When someone is exposed to and changed by the power of the gospel, their outlook on life changes. They have new goals. They're given a new purpose. Again, think of the Apostle Paul, and I'll have you turn to Philippians 3. That same Apostle who was once a Pharisee, a God-hating, although he would have said that he loved God, he didn't, a God-hating, Christian-hating, Christian-killing Pharisee, had letters in hand to cause more problems for Christians there in Damascus. He is confronting the Judaizers who have hounded him every leg of his ministry and have sought to twist those who have been saved and turn them away from walking according to the true gospel. And so Paul, Paul warns the Philippian church as he had to uh, the Galatian church. But he, I think he's getting out ahead of things here with the Philippians and not having to correct as much as he is warning here. Verse 1 of chapter 3, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, is indeed not grievous, but for you it is safe. You need the reminders. We all need regular reminders from God because we regularly forget. We regularly decide to do our own thing. We regularly need God to hit us upside the head and say, Hey, wake up. Pay attention to what my word is saying and live right. We need that. And so Paul was doing that. Verse 2, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. All very derogatory terms uh, for those self-righteous Judaizers. For we, verse 3, are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And, And that idea of no confidence in the flesh referring to Uh, salvation. I don't trust in myself for salvation. (coughs) I trust in Christ. Though, verse 4, I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Now we know, and we're going to get into this in in just a minute, but we know Paul is not saying all these things for the purpose of bragging. He's proving a point that the things that the Judaizers believe matter the most. Paul is going to say, yeah, that used to matter the most to be. Now, it doesn't. And he's going to be very, very graphic about that. Very, very clear. Uh, Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, Those I counted lost for Christ. I was willing to let go of my hold on everything that was important to me. My purpose changed. My perspective changed. And I counted all those things. I was willing to lose all those things to give them up because I have Christ. And Christ is so much better. Verse 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. This is the most important thing to Paul, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. 
Paul's life completely changed when he got saved. Those things that mattered so much to him, that defined him, were no longer the most important part of his life. Now the most important thing was, I want to know Christ better, and I want to help other people know Christ. Folks, we need to have the same purpose. We may have other interests. We may have different responsibilities that God has given us and that others have given us, and we need to uphold those responsibilities. But our first responsibility is to Jesus Christ, our King, and He has told us to go and to tell people about Him so that they can be saved. We know Him, and we know the change that He has made in our life, and I think every one of us here would testify that we are thankful for the change that He is working in our hearts. We need to pray that God will give us a a hunger to tell other people about Jesus so that he can change their hearts too. More important than, and I mentioned politics earlier, and I've mentioned it a lot lately because it's a, a hot issue right now, but more important than getting somebody to vote differently is telling them about Jesus Christ. That has a much greater impact. It's much more powerful, and it lasts forever. Who they vote for is consequential, but it's not ultimate It's not eternal. Their soul is. And so we need to, if we're going to champion, I said this on Sunday, if we're going to champion someone's cause, we need to champion the cause of Christ and make that our goal. People need to be saved. The power of the Holy Spirit is the power of the Great Commission. The Holy Spirit of God brings boldness to preach the gospel. He brings conviction to the hearts of those who hear the gospel. He changes the lives of those who receive the gospel. His power provides evidence of salvation through separated lives, through healed marriages, and through people who are actively serving the Lord. The Spirit of God is available to empower Christians to do more than we could ever do for Christ apart from Him. The same Spirit of God who met with the early church in the upper room can meet with us today here on our property. The same Holy Spirit who empowered the apostles to turn the world upside down, can empower us to turn our city upside down for Christ. What you'll not find in the book of Acts among the early church is any reference to talent or ability and and holding that in highest esteem. What you will find is ordinary people. You'll find an old disciple who is still a faithful servant. Got some good news. Because we're ordinary people. God uses ordinary people in extraordinary ways. He's the extraordinary one. We sometimes think that we're the extraordinary ones. We're not. We're ordinary. But he is extraordinary. And we can trust him to use us. And he will. He wants to. If, if Christians want to do more for the cause of Christ, we must have his power. More than praying for miracles, we need to pray for God's power, for God's spirit, and for God to enable us to do what we should be doing. The power of God empowers the church to make a difference in the world. We must seek the power of God in order to have it. Are we making a difference to anybody? Are you making a difference to anybody, spiritually, eternally? Let's let's be very personal about this. And I'm not doing so... Uh, hypocritically, because I have asked myself this question this week. Am I making a difference for anybody? We must seek God's power in order to make any kind of positive difference for somebody. The church must prioritize the power of God. That is why we need to live holy lives. God's not going to fill dirty vessels. He will fill empty ones. We need to empty ourselves of ourselves of our wishes, our desires, and our wants that are independent of what God wants for us. We must yield to the Spirit of God to use us in the greatest way possible to fulfill the Great Commission. Last week, I encouraged you, if you were here, and if not, I'll encourage you again, if you didn't watch the service or come, I'd encourage you to make a list of people that you know specifically need Jesus Christ as their Savior. It might be a list of neighbors. It might be a list of coworkers. It might be a list of doctors or nurses. It might be a list of, of people that you see at the store every week that, you know, that ring up your food or, or they take your order at the restaurant every single Sunday or whatever it is. And, and you have regular contact with these people. Put them on your list and pray for them. And then as you pray for them, pray that God will give you opportunities to reach them. 
Seek out those opportunities. Now, God may just hand you an opportunity on the platter, and it's always great when he does that, but many times God has the opportunity. We need to go and get it. We need to go and, and harvest. So what are we waiting for? Make your list. Pray for those people. Pray for opportunities to reach those people. Pray, pray that Lord, the Lord will work in your own heart and give you the boldness that you need to take those opportunities. And then just be ready at all times. Whether you have gospel tracts with you, whether you just share your personal testimony. I've said this many times, but a personal testimony can be one of the most powerful methods of witnessing. Just telling somebody what God did in your heart. Because they, if it, whether you've met them for the first time or they've known you for years or maybe, maybe all of your life, when they, can make it, when they can see that it's personal to you, they're much more likely to want to believe it for themselves. Doesn't that make sense? If, if, something, if we're convinced of something, we're going to have an easier time convincing somebody else of something and conveying how much it means to us. I could stand up here and I could talk about you know, <clears throat> things that I have no... No desire about, okay? So, um, you know, it's, it's sports season, and uh, I, could, I could talk about wrestling, okay? I can't really talk a, lot, a whole, whole lot about wrestling. It just came up, but I, I could say a few things. You know, I know that people wear really ridiculous-looking, um, I don't want to say costumes, uh, uniforms, um, outfits, whatever it is that they put on, they look absolutely ridiculous, and they, they have to fight, they have to pin each other down. I could try to talk about it, and I could try to make you think that I really, really care about it, but deep down I don't, and deep down you know that I don't. And so you'll hear my, my dispassionate passion trying to convince you of something that doesn't really mean a whole lot for me. When we don't genuinely have a heart for the gospel and a heart for somebody's soul, that can come across in our witness, and it seems empty. Now, God can still use that. His word does not return void. But how much more powerful do you think our testimony could be if the gospel meant what it needs to mean to us so that we could communicate that to those who need it? Just let me challenge you with that. Be a witness and trust the Lord for his power. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the power which saved us from our sins. I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit which convicts us when we have sinned again and again and again and shows us where we need to uh, make changes in our lives, sin that needs to be expelled. Your, your word gives us the wisdom, gives us the power to live right, to stay walking and living right for you. You're, you promised in the Great Commission to be with us always. Always providing comfort. Always providing wisdom. Always providing uh, the knowledge of your word, always providing power and ability and authority so that we can witness like you expect us to witness, and so often we are disconnected from that power. Lord, I pray that you will help me to trust in your power in a greater way this week so that I can be a witness for Christ in a much more powerful way. I pray for each person here or listening that you will help them to trust in your power so that they can be the witness that you expect them to be. Help us to have compassion. You looked on the, the, the multitudes and you had compassion on them, not just physically providing food, but spiritually. You saw that they were as sheep without a shepherd. They needed the great shepherd. And, and countless people around us need the great shepherd. They need a personal relationship with Jesus. We have one. Help us to be willing to share that. Help us to have compassion on those who are lost, not to see them as, as uh, obstacles, not to see them as people who are in our way when we're trying to shop or get our food, but people who need Jesus Christ. Help us to be bold. We need that help. We, we can be prone to nervousness. We can be prone to fear, to giving up and hoping that somebody else will witness to them. Lord, help us to be bold. Souls depend on it. And how will they hear without somebody preaching to them? So I pray you would use us greatly. Help us to reach our city. As the apostles were, were said to have turned the world upside down because of their faithfulness, their preaching, and, and the witness that they were for Jesus Christ, help us to turn our community upside down because we're, we're just telling everybody that we can about Jesus and, and you are saving souls. I pray that you would do a great work in our hearts, draw us closer to our Savior, and I pray that you'll do a great work through us so that many people can hear the gospel and be saved.
Christian, let me just encourage you during this time, maybe, maybe get somebody on your mind right now that you know is not saved, and during this time, as, as your kind of plays, just pray for them. Pray that God will begin working in their heart. Ephesians 2 says, You hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. Pray that he will begin that quickening work, that he'll begin that work of revealing to them that they are sinners, that they need a Savior. I encourage you then to pray for yourself, that God will give you an opportunity. If God put them on your mind, on your heart, then he wants you to do something about it. Pray that God will give you the boldness and the opportunity to do something about it. You plant that seed and you let the Lord work. You can't save somebody. You're not expected to save anybody. But you can plant the seed. You can get the process started by just telling them about the Lord. Will you commit to doing that? Father, just please convict us about this. Please challenge us. Please help us. Souls need to be saved. We have the gospel. We know the Savior who can save. I pray that you would help us to connect Savior to sinners. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Will you stand please? Heads bowed and eyes closed. I encourage you to spend some time personally praying for your opportunities. Pray for the, uh, a person or, or however many the Lord has put on your heart that God will work through you to give them the gospel that they might be saved. Spend some time praying for that right now.